Today's guest, we are super excited to have him on, DJ Murakami. How are you, brother? Good, man. Good to be on here, Dennis and Neil. Good to talk Good to you guys here. after so long. Yeah, man. Lockdown. Shelter in place. Good times. Good times. Uh, so, uh, for the listeners out there, uh, DJ, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, I'm a personal trainer out of Southern California. Also have a online movement university uh, where we present different training modalities, coaches, instructors. Me and myself, I like to I like to test strength in various different ways. That pretty much just lift up weird weird shit. But yeah. <laughs> What's your uh, social media handle? So everybody, all the listeners, will, if they're not following you, they can jump on your accounts there. Sure. It is at Strong Camps on Instagram. Yeah, definitely go check his social media page out. It's, he's got some good stuff. Um, you know, a lot of stuff there uh, will make you think, you know, about your type, your training and, you know, what, what's possible. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a lot of it is based off of curiosity. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't look at, so like something like my page or other people, Bud Jeffrey's page or Juji Mufu's page as like, this is a training program or this is, uh, you know, some progressive, uh, scheme. It's just fun. You know, it's just, uh, exploring possibilities. That's what I like to do. That's what I enjoy doing. That's what I enjoy seeing other people do is kind of, push the boundaries, the limits, you know, um, be creative, uh, in their movement and strength. And, you know, that's what I like to, to post and expose. Do you think that's a, a missing element in training today? Just that ability to, to play, be creative, you know, not have something so structured. I mean, I, I love conventional exercise. I think structure is a good, good base, but I do think the complexity holds so much growth and teaching and lessons in it that can inform your, let's say conventional practice inside the gym, you know, uh, whether in that could be sport, that could be jujitsu, that could be um, dance, something outside that has in life where you're dealing with variables and you're reacting and you're trying to solve a problem with your body creating solutions through movement and you know, the gym should complement that should support that practice. Uh, but when I guess that, I guess something that triggers me an issue I have is when the goal becomes getting good at exercising because you're supposed to get good at exercising. You know, I, I think we should have some sort of meaning, some sort of play in our lives that we could express ourselves through physically it's pretty interesting because you said that about uh creativity imagination play and so many adults it's literally when you tell them to do that you, you, it's like they look at you like you're telling them to break the law yeah they're like is this okay like they're gonna get arrested for it like there's a police officer waiting around the corner if they do something that's that they would have done as a 10 year old that someone's going to be there to give them a citation for that. It, it's really weird when you get that that look or that questioning behind, from your clients when you ask them to do that. I think a lot of that is our fault, you know, as in the exercise science or, the, you know, the fitness industry, because see what happens when you post something silly, especially involving load or weight, you will get, um, reprimanded, you, you will get yeah. <laughs> uh, scolded on the internet because what you're doing is wrong or it's inefficient or it's risky or you're promoting something dangerous. And um, I mean, that's the form police, right? That's mm -hmm. the biomechanists and all these people who they have a point. Maybe there's certain ways and leverages that work better than others, but that's in such a specific uh, it's actually sport that, that comes from sport. Maybe it's powerlifting or something else where there's rules and it's just an arbitrary invention, cultural invention. It's a game in itself, but we make that the standard for movement across the board. And, uh, you know, we can't get out of that context. So, yeah, I mean, to show 
to let people know. And I think the people who watch that, they just take the authority's word like, okay, this is bad. Don't lift like this. Don't move like this. So yeah, when you go into a play scenario and those rules are tossed out, then people are like, okay, what, what kind of framework do I have now? How should I move? And it's hard to trust yourself in a way. It's uh, And that kind of leads into what we're seeing today with, with educators uh, attacking each other. So if we're seeing educators attacking each other, then as a general public person, as just a regular fitness enthusiast or a trainer, then that's going to really instill that type of mentality in myself. Is that not for the most part? Do you think the general public even knows who they are though? Well, I think a lot of fit, no, but no, fitness, a lot of fitness people now with social media, because if you catch the right uh, ad, if you catch the right post, they'll curio- you know, curiosity wise, they'll click on and look at it and go, okay, I like that. And then yeah. maybe they'll start following that account and get into it. But yes, the majority of trainers that are following these accounts you get that cultish following where yes, this is this is it, and this is not, and then you get that bashing back and forth. But if the leaders of these systems are the ones bashing each other in the heads over the head with their systems, then the people underneath them are going to say, "Well, okay, this is what this is what you're supposed to, what do. You're supposed to yeah. do." Then, if, you and know? I think it, the trainers who do, you know, because it's tribalism, right? So the trainers mm-hmm. who are in a certain tribe who have this ideology they pass that down to their clients. You know, they're the ones repeating, this is bad, this is good. You know, they might be informing or educating them. Um, and, and I mean, I've seen this. They prop up this enemy of movement that's not good and they instill that in their clients. And I've seen it. I've worked with clients who have been training with other people for years and, um they have a lot of baggage as far as this is bad movement, this is good movement. A lot of it is nocebo that actually affects their pain. I, this is a story I feel horrible telling because I tell it all the time. And then I say, I tell this story all the time, but I keep doing it. But it's a beautiful example <laughs> is I had a lady, uh, I like to use sandbags. So there's a sandbag. I said, uh, okay, let's do presses with the sandbag. So she picked it up off the ground, brought it to her shoulders and pressed it overhead. After that, I said, okay, we're going to deadlift the sandbag. She went down, got in this setup, arch, braced, went to pull midway, dropped it and said, I can't, it hurts my back. I'm not really do well with deadlifts. And it's amazing. She just picked the bag off the ground previously to press it over her head. But once I said the word deadlift, everything from her past training experience and what people told her and how she had to do it kicked in. And it could have been emotional baggage. She could have been injured doing it before. But you could tell she was really trying to have this perceived perfect form and she felt pain doing it. The the time before where she just listened to her body and picked it up however it felt comfortable, it didn't even phase her. So I see this like amplified through these um, camps of training that just bash other ways of movement. Like it's all movement, right? And uh, so I think it's a slippery slope when we start taking away whole dimensions and positions and ranges and all, you know, all these other things because we deem it unsafe or non-functional or, you know, whatever verbiage you use. Yeah. And if you were to, to record this person, you know, 24 seven during their, just their daily life, you'd see them get into thousands of different positions and that's okay. Yeah. They, picking up a pillow off the ground, your kid, a piece yep. of you know, trash. I guarantee you're very seldom going to see them go in a proper conventional deadlift form to pick something up. Oh, that might be true. the only thing you don't see. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, when I'm teaching, I always, you know, you've, you've heard me DJ where I tell people, I'm like, if you're passed out the street, you don't give a shit about my neutral spine. You don't give it. You just want me to get you out of the street. You don't care how I get you out of the street. Just remove me from the danger zone. And that person's not going to, people aren't going to be around going, oh, wait, 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 make sure your feet are set. <laughs> are you are you doing this with your hips? Or you've got, you know, 
Are you braced? No, your your reaction is instantaneous. It's immediate. It's just get the task done. Period. Right. Yeah, I would only critique you after. Yeah, afterwards yeah. we can do that. <laughs> Once the person's out of danger, then we can do that for sure. So for people that don't follow DJ's account, he does a lot of where you live. You have you have an area where there's a lot of rocks available, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's. And I love that. I, I think it's freaking fantastic. It's, it's awesome. And uh, so about how long ago did you start to transition to that type of training? Um, I mean, I wouldn't even call the, the odd object lifting my training per se, but uh, I was, there was uh, right behind my house, this uh, little trail in the hills that I would walk all the time. And I would always pass this rock, this big stone. And, you know, I began to look at it and be like, I wonder if I could pick that up. (laughs) And I I didn't do it. And um, I think one day I just went up and tugged on it and it didn't budge at all. And I was like, wait a minute. I lift a lot more weight than this in the gym. Like, I'm stronger than this, but I cannot, (laughs) I can't even budge this rock. So it kind of light bulb went off and um, I started working towards, you know, lifting this rock, which I didn't get for like more than a year. I found smaller rocks and uh, started lifting them up. And, you know, it it gave me some information. I learned some things like, hey, maybe lifting a barbell is specific to a barbell uh, compared to something in between your legs and in between your hands that you're squeezing. Um, and then, you know, I'd always love sandbag training. So I, I started kind of really going deeper into that as a means of gaining strength, looking at how, how what I was doing in the gym, uh, if it carried over, you know, I, I would, I would just test things out. Can I do this. Can I do that? Um, but yeah, it, it's still, I, I still don't want to come off like I don't do the, the basics, conventional stuff, because I, I love that, and that's a bread and butter. But I do love testing out and exploring these uh, strength riddles, I would call them. You know, something you can't – it's not skill-based so much. Uh, you don't know you're going to have to adjust as you go. It could be very asymmetrical. You know, you might be having a twist to one side, offset – footing in the ground grips wherever you could find a good point um so it's it's a fun fun test to throw in so but what do you say that um you know it is a skill to lift a rock because you you know you've had to you had to build that coordination of where to where to tense up you know where to shift your weight um where to put the right pressure you know that ability to find the right leverage and grip i'd say maybe you built a ton of strength conventionally and then you just had to you think maybe just the technique of lifting a rock was what you had to build yeah definitely i think it's a yeah skill technique i mean everything's a skill right (laughs) yeah Uh, but yeah i think it just gave me more information it increased my strength iq movement intelligence um gave me more options uh, so yeah, I think the, the base of, you know, just force output, if it is there and you learn how to navigate in different ways, which could be, uh, technical, um, yeah, you, you need both and yeah, but it's interesting. I had, you know, I experimented with some clients like, Hey, I had a lady who lifted, she was strong. She could squat 245, um, deadlift more and I had her lift like a 50 pound sandbag and same thing. She dropped it and was like, you know, this bothers my back. She had a hard time lifting that sandbag. So we did a phase uh, where it was just sandbag strength work. And at the end of it, we retested the barbell movements and she was hitting PRs. And that was interesting, you know, so maybe, you know, it's N of one, but I could see how the, the people I've seen progress through, this are yeah maybe just filling in some holes and gaps and that just makes structurally the the system better i think what we see things that 
the three of us do, it's we're teaching people how to manipulate what they're utilizing. And that's a big thing of what they're missing. They don't understand manipulation of low, controlling what it is regardless of what it is. And that's a big that's a big missing thing is is that if you can really teach somebody that aspect, then these can conventional things that we're used to doing just become much easier because a bar with a hand, anything with a handle or bar is much easier to control than they're giving you a handle for a reason. Right. But if you use something that doesn't have a handle that you're, that's going to move around or it is odd shaped, that brings that whole new dimension. So if you get really good at that, in my opinion, your conventional stuff is going to really be, easier to access yeah i think what is your like let's say a conventional strict barbell uh pulling or pressing like what's your intent behind it like we have a task set up where it's like get it up from the ground but if you listen to say a a generic crossfit coach they're like rip the bar apart arch the chest up and that's the exact opposite thing you would do if your lip lifting up a stone or the groceries or a kid, you're literally creating the opposite torque throughout the body. And, you know, I I like what you said. So if we could set up a task like that and you are now accessing a different tension throughout the body, a different line, different direction of torque, um, that's only going to help you level up, especially if you might've been deficient in that. And, you know, the more you could do that in different areas and, It's just more information. That's just more intelligence in your body. And I think, you know, there's, there's no good or bad. It's just give me more, you know, I want more. (laughs) Because we all teach compression a lot. I mean, the three of us, we teach compression strength. Uh, I mean, and and those torque sticks that you use, I mean, I tried that 80 kilo torque stick, bro. (laughs) Dude, it didn't budge, bro. I got a long way to go. That's Holy nasty, man. shit! Yeah, I, I, I can um, I can bend it, but I can't do it. I guess <laughs> conventionally, right? I can't do it this way. I've got to, I've got to angle my body a certain way, and then I can kind of, I can bend it that way. But yeah, if you ask me to do anything in here or here, nope, it's not moving. You know what's funny about those? It, so similar, Neil, to like a, a climb or a dyno you're trying to hit, right? Yeah. Um, there was ones that I couldn't budge forever. And all it took was once that I got it and I could do it easily after that. It is, there's, there's a weird psychological aspect to that. That's uh, fun to play around with. Well, cause it was funny because Neil, I had the 20, 40, 60 and then Neil's like, Oh, have you got, did you get the 80? I was like, no. And so he brings it in. He's like, I got the 80. He hands it to me. And I was just all, <laughs> I was like, son of a bitch. I'm like, ah. and I'm thinking, I'm going, Chris freaking went, <laughs> and what, he did 10 reps on that 80, right? Savage Protocol. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a strong dude. I was like, holy shit, are you kidding me, dude? He just cranked on that thing. I was like, yeah, I got, I got some work to do. <laughs> I was like, wow. That was very humbling, to say the least. But compression strength is big and that's why when we go to lift stuff if you're being taught just strictly conventional stuff you know you, you go to lift some a lot more uh, different objects you're going to have some serious issues because you're just missing that whole compression of, of just how to squeeze in and create all that inner tension as opposed to pulling apart on it yeah it makes me think of like uh, f- wrestlers or gymnasts who come in and you're like, okay, let's, we're going to lift and they're just excel. And you feel like you're the best coach ever. (laughs) It's like, Hey, maybe there was something to that, uh, tension or, you know, that was infused in their sport that really carries over, even though it's not the movement per se pattern. Um, they could just get shit done when you ask them to do it. It's a very impressive. When you see somebody that's, that's buff, you know, they go to the gym, they have that conventional, nice physique, they look, you see them, they lift some weight, but then you get this other person that doesn't have any outstanding physique, so to speak, but they wrestle or they grapple. And then you go, if you were to do that with the both of them, 
to feel that strength difference and how they can manipulate and move and be strong during that movement versus that person with that nice chiseled physique that doesn't move as fluidly, doesn't move as well, has a lot of gaps in their movements. And so I think what we're looking at there is the integration of all your fascial lines and being able to connect all of them through all your entire movements without those gaps. I like that. Yeah. I've been, I, I've spent a long time trying to like articulate what that is like that farm boy strength, like dad strength, you know, um, what is that quality? And I'm thinking, you know, it's gotta be, cause one of the things that makes people like that stand out is they're just so strong in the transverse plane, you know, mm -hmm. and they move so well in, in space. And like you said, once they get their hands on you, you know, they're, you're they like, Oh to, shit. Right? Uh oh, I'm a deep shit. Uh oh yeah. It's like, uh, you know, that ability to, to harness, you know, all your strength and then project it in whatever direction you want, essentially. And we've had comments where people have talked about, we've had some comments where people have like, well, if you're doing this and this is this fossil line, but you're not integrating this. And you and I have talked about it, like, uh, kind of using everything, you're using all the everything. Time. as soon as you go to integrate it, apply tension or force into anything, Things, parts of your body just don't don't just shut off and go. I got nothing to do with yeah, this. Yeah, you might have one area working harder than the others, but you know everything works together. I mean, we still have that tensegrity model. So if we're creating tension on one area, the whole entire unit is is affected. But uh, it's from seeing these comments, we're getting an idea of the perceived mental limitations or perspectives that a lot of coaches have. They're like, this is the old, this is the way it, the, what's being used. This is what's taking place. And you're like, Ooh. I think there's a lot more layers to it. Yeah, it's, it's the reductionist view. And I, I mean, all systems, even the ones we named before, like I think they're all right in a way. Is when they do the, the fear mongering or they, they try to claim that there's a right or wrong way to do it or, you know, you – you, you have a shitty shoulder, you know, you're not allowed to do this until, uh, I give you a shoulder. You have this many degrees. Now you're functional. Now you have a prerequisite to walk around, or this is how you're supposed to walk around, or you need this locomotive, blah, blah, blah. The thing, uh, and it's stick mobility is one of the only systems you could say this about. It's literally, here's a tool that helps here's some ways to use it. You know, it, it, it's not saying this is the right way. This is the wrong way. It's like, here's something that could give you more options and help you produce force in these ranges. So that's, it's, it's refreshing in a way, you know, because you don't get in that tribal, that, that narrative where this is how the body works and this is how it, it's not supposed to move. So I think we need more of that. Definitely. The, the one thing I love with the stick is it allows you to get into that specific angle or, or missing gap that you have and work that isometrically and know that you're stable, you're good, and you can start to work that range of motion or that specific range of motion in, in a way that's going to be safe and in a way that you're going to progressively be able to ask for more force output when you feel you have that capability. When the brain says, okay, I'm good with this. I'm good if you turn up the dial a little bit more too, right? So, I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about using a stick. And and for people listening out there, it doesn't have to be our stick. People always say, well, I was, just use a stick. It's just a tool. But we're just going to teach you how to utilize it so that way – like DJ said, it gives you more options. It gives you more ability to access uh, those areas that you just kind of skate over really quickly because your brain's like, oh, we're not good there. Let's get, and the body's like, yep, let's just get through that. Right? So if we can fill those potholes in and make that route, road nice and smooth, that's going to be a nice road to drive down versus that road that's just filled with potholes that are just going to beat the crap out of your car. Yeah, and it gives people a 
you're pretty much just setting up a task. So you're saying, all right, push into the stick, like drive, like you have something to overcome and go. And that bypasses the whole like form issue or why am I doing this issue? Why am I trying to get two more degrees? It's like all of that, here's the task, do it, feel it, and you have something to fight against. Which you said, it, it could be anything. It could be the coach's maybe arm right there. But yeah, it's hard to, I'm thinking bow and arrow. That's hard to mimic. You know, it's a good yeah. tool for that job. So tell us a little about your online program and, and what that's about. The Majestic Mirth, uh, John Yoon, we created a platform for different uh, systems of movement and different modalities of movement. So every month we, uh, a different presenter uh, kind of showcases, teaches their stuff uh, in an introductory way. And, you know, if people want to continue or go further down that rabbit hole, they could contact the instructor. But it's a way to introduce people to different types of training. And I think, I mean, I've learned a lot from watching it because then it's like we've had, let's say, four hand balancing coaches on so far over the past couple of years. There's coaches who 100% contradict each other. Um, you know, they kind of put down the other way of training and you start to realize, oh, everything works. Or maybe this coach uh, is better for a certain population or a certain personality type or body type, whatever, or maybe you need this style of training at a different time in your, your career or your movement practice. So it helps me see all these people that they're offering value, saying something that works, saying the same thing in a different way. And, um, that it's all just different, different tools, but I'm one of those people who <laughs> I was in this phase where I would go to a certification every few months. I was searching for the truth. You know, I was grasping for information that would, you know, make me feel comfortable about how the body should move. And, um, you know, this is a way to get a taste of all these things and, you know, decide for yourself if it's something you want to go into. But yeah, I think it's 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 kind of like the Netflix of movement. It's interesting seeing all these different themes and stories and movement practices, and dance, breath work. We have a strong man in there tearing cards next to a belly dancer the next month, and uh, <laughs> That's you awesome. know we could work on breath work, uh, and then you know strength work. So. Yeah, it's, it's cool to see all the possibilities and the, the whole spectrum of, of how people access physicality and movement. Because uh, another question I struggle with is like, what is strength? Once again, you know, we talked about skill. It's improving yourself at something, but we have so many options. Choose what you love to do. And I think it's cool to have a place where all these uh, different options and games are open to uh, to experience. So now, if someone signs up for your program, do they have access to to everything? Or is it basically kind of like a a module style thing where people, you know, that you take? Let's say I want to take your hand balancing course. Um, is it like a month long program? And you're going through all the different phases. Um, how do you have that set up? Yeah. So when you join. Uh, if you join the subscription, you'll have access to all previous units. Each unit's a month long, so it'll be, you know, week one, week two, week three, progressions. It'll be, um, you know, six plus hours of webinars with the instructor, you know, answering questions, uh, troubleshooting, Q&A, giving feedback. Yeah, if you're in the current module, you'll get FaceTime with the coach. You'll get feedback and analysis from the instructor. What's your, if you had to recommend to the coaches listening to the podcast, if you had to give a top five uh, systems that you would recommend or courses that you would recommend them taking, what would those be? Oh, that's a tough one. Because there's a lot out yeah, there. And right. I think that's the problem is there's so many out there. The coaches are like, what do I take? 
you know, or, or what are the best ones or what are the top ones I should go after? Yeah, I, I hesitate even answering that because, um, well, I mean, you won't like hurt our feelings said, if you don't mention us. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I was gonna. I, I said it before. Stick mobility is yeah. like you guys offer a tool that could help everything, right? Mm-hmm. There's other good systems, but what worries me is the narrative behind them, behind the tools they offer. And I've seen people get caught in that and get caught in the echo chamber, and then it ends up limiting them, actually. Mm -hmm. But if you have the ability to go in with an open mind and say, you know, what can I take from this? Uh, You know, what are some tools I could take to help? Then then it's almost anything, you know, Mm -hmm. functional patterns, whatever, like you'll learn something from all of them and especially through experience and practicing it. Yeah. That you could get trapped in the tribe and in the ideology, which is scary. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I've been in that situation before where you're talking to someone who's so smart and so well-spoken and they have this beautiful system and it's like, this is going to take care of you. This is what you need. I'll hold your hand and, just do this and you get, you can get trapped inside of that. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would almost say what I would recommend more is to find a mentor or a coach to work with. Um, it'll be a much different experience than just going to a weekend seminar, you know, maybe find someone who has that knowledge and work with them. And then they're going to work with you as an individual. And I think it'll be a little more nuanced than uh, just a, a weekend cert. So then do you have a mentor or coach that you work with personally? I kind of go through a different one every like three, four years. I was doing a mentorship under Julian Pinnell past few years. Um, I, I've stopped that since then, but that was my most recent one. Went in skeptical, went in curious, soaked up as much knowledge as I could. Um, and it was through a certain... Uh, uh, a lens that that system viewed movement and I had to integrate it into my lens and how I view movement. And it's, you know, just continually, continually changing. I'm not familiar with, with Julian. Um, what kind of work is that? Julian, uh, is the creator of, uh, strong fit. Oh, okay. The sandbags. Yeah. So he has this theory, uh, I guess you can call it of torque chains. So usually when we think of torque, we think of like a joint specific, like we're creating a rotation a certain way, but he views it sort of from the nervous system level and the entire um, body has two chains pretty much of muscles, one's internal torque and one external torque. And this ties into like lines of fascia and stuff, pretty much creating movements through accessing different torques. Uh, And that really resonated with me and interested me. And that's been something it took me maybe a year and a half, two years to even tap into the feeling and experience of what the theoretical framework was behind it. Uh, So yeah, that that was just a a research process for me. But uh, it's very interesting if you guys are looking at at that concept, especially how he ties it into just conventional lifting, you know? And so that's where you got your chi torque uh from so that that (laughs) that was actually from that was born from a conversation with uh savage chris chamberlain okay um so i was uh the (laughs) i was also into the uh hanging out with the weck david weck Mm -hmm. a lot um interesting guy (laughs) fascinating guy but chris is like very level-headed, very, um, he, he could like translate all of, of crazy wax information <laughs> to the layperson and kind of distill it in a practical way. I'm talking with him and he's like, Hey, I want to show you some stuff out. I want, want you to get into this. And what he was describing the spiraling, right? Uh, like they call it the coil. Mm-hmm. So he was teaching me the coil and it took that this took a while because he just he's like here's this drill or here's this position i want you to mimic but i finally connected and tapped into it and then i went to one of their first like certification courses whatever and um i saw a room full of people mimicking this position some of them were 
most of them weren't tapping into it. Some of them were tapping into the opposite line of tension. Like uh, they, they wanted this deep lat QL glute mead out outer calf, like weight on the outside of the foot. And then Julian Pinau is talking external torque chain is outside of the foot, outer calf, deep lat, all the exact same chain they were both describing. So I'm like, Oh, there's something here, except you guys, you're splitting it. One side's the opposite internal torque, one side's external torque. So when I started describing the chain to him, and now we're using tactile cues in, in certain muscles, people started tapping into this coil they want to do. I'm like, there's something here. And, ma- and I think there's a new language that make both systems make sense. Because we, me and Chris were kind of teaching each other and coming at the same experience from two different languages. So the language we came up with in the end was the, the Chi Torque, just a great tool. Um, like we created symbols to match with certain tensions and torques. And then we created the symbols out of emojis to make it easy. So then we all these combinations. And then after that, when Chris found this cool new move or position with the rope, he would just say like, oh, it's going to be split ice fire on the left side and then go into more of a long side ice on the right side. So we're using this crazy language, but then right away he would say that and I would tap into the, the tension he wanted. So I'm like, this is just a great learning tool if people can connect to the experience instead of how a lot of coaching is where it's just position-based. Like screw the, f- push your knees out, you know, rip the bar apart you know, head through, you know, show your armpits. And I think that's dangerous, especially with load, because you're maybe not connecting to the, to the tension that would automatically create that position. And I think if those two are disconnected, the, the intent's not there, the true intent. So, you know, it's going back to something like the stick. It, it's great tool because you could say, push, create the tension, create the force, go. And you're not thinking about choreographing some shape. You're just accessing the force to get the task done. But anyway, yeah, long-winded story. That's how Chi Torque was created. Um. <laughs> so have you found that, you know, when people really tap into this primary, that strength carries over to, to the activities that they do? Yeah. I, so when I started, we started testing it on people. Uh, we found big discrepancies. So something that, I mean, the whole time someone would do a certain movement and, you know, looked fine to me, it looked form, looked great. But now when I was like, okay, we're going to do it through this tension, they either couldn't do it or they got super weak or there was a huge imbalance. And that was a lens uh, or an assessment that I never, you know, used before. So filling those things in, of course, like we talked about more information, you gain something, you fill the hole somewhere. It just made everything better. Um, Not saying that that's going to fix everything or that's what you need, but hey, maybe it's a a new lens to look at things. Um, More information, the better. But yeah, uh, it's it's helped, especially with range of motion and mobility. Um, A lot of people would just, they just wanted this joint or this limb to reach a certain position. Um, and they're like, okay, we're going to reach this position now through torque like you would do in sport or real life. And it would be just not there at all. Like they couldn't access any. And, you know, hey, it might be worth trying to build up that capacity and see if it helps. And a lot of times uh, it did help. So what about, uh, so with mobility for you, you know, do you stretch or is it more strength-based? To be honest, I haven't used, I tried not to use the word mobility in 2019 and 2012. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> I just consider it strength. Like you guys know this, if there's a range you want, just get stronger there. You know, if there's something you want to control, if there's something you want to be proficient in, you know, create force and tension through that range and it will be more easily accessible. As far as stretching, oh man. I hate to say it, but whenever I get um, smoke uh, marijuana and get high, yeah. I find myself stretching a lot. <laughs> yeah, we'll be watching TV. I'll bust the sticks out, and I just start 
you start moving. Start moving. And you start moving, and then you. I think the biggest issue is I have to. I, I start. I have to. I because I'll forget. I'll be like, oh shit! I better write this down before I forget. You know. So oh, you mean like creating new things? Yeah, or, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of times where I'm like, oh wait a minute, oh that felt good. I haven't done that before. Oh okay, and then okay, note to self. Or I'll hand her my phone and I'll say, hey, take a photo, take a photo real quick, so I have something to reference back to. Because uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wake up the next morning and be like, what the hell was that that I was doing last night? What the hell was that again? I can't remember. But yeah, you get creative, and, and that's really where you. You know, you you need to be at is to experiment and, and play around with it. So you're saying, like, you would access a uh, a different line of tension that you haven't tapped into in a while. Yeah, I just start to think about the, you know, or I'll see a photo of somebody in a certain position, and I'll be like, okay, well, let me see what I can do to make myself stronger in that position. What happens if I push the stick here versus pushing the stick in this direction? Uh, I'll pull the stick here or I'll push the stick here. And and that's really where it starts to, to – that's where everything starts to come from is that creativity and going, okay, what are the possibilities? And that's the big thing. It's, it's figuring out. I, this is a range of motion that this person had to access. I didn't – I haven't seen that before. Now let me see. First of all, can I get into that position or something close to that position? And then what can I do generating force in that position? And can I? And then depending on which direction of force, how does that affect the position? And I think it goes back to something you said, DJ, is just being constantly curious. And I know Dennis and I, with the sticks, that's what we we're just we're curious. So we'll, we'll try you know, everything with it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's yeah. infinite possibilities, right? Like yeah. you have 360 degree bubble world of movement possibilities and especially with the stick you could access all the different vectors and all the different lines and yeah it's uh it's fun to see what people come up with too you know i'll see some you guys will post something like oh, i gotta try that <laughs> yeah and then uh, we have other coaches of course that post stuff more like oh that's great yeah shit, didn't even think about that that's awesome you know and that's, that's the beautiful a- thing about that community is the fact that we each coach has their specific things that they're really good at and that they love to coach. And now we're seeing their perspective in that area. And we're going, Oh, okay. I like that. Didn't think about that before. That's really good. And so it's great to have that diversity in the, in our coaching realm that are still all using the sticks and finding benefits on how to use the sticks and integrate. Yeah, it's cool that it's like crowdsourced, you know, all, all the users uh, are playing around in their specific domains and coming up with just different different movements to try. You know, it's, it's a great co- community and collective. And I think that's the other thing too, is I think that's one thing that we've pushed uh, amongst our coaches is the fact that If you have a certain issue with a client or something you're having a problem with, you have other people in the community with a different scope and a different mindset that can come back and say, hey, why don't you try this? You know, because you haven't, you don't think along those lines. And so to be able to reach out to people and say, hey, this is something I'm having an issue with and this person can has a different set of eyes and they can say, okay, well, have you tried this? Oh, I haven't. I'll give it a go. And, you know, they'll say, this is the reason why I would use this or give this a try. And they say, all right, let's see if it works. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, go back to the drawing board and find something else. But it's that it's the fact that I think for us, we want to really teach and really drive home that sense of working together versus against each other. And that's a big thing that I think we, we, we talk about all the time in the industry where there's just so much butting heads versus, hey, you've got all these different perspectives. See what's out there. See what works and what doesn't work for you. Yeah, and so many people have gotten strong doing so many different things, right? So many different things. You know, we had a, when we, we were talking to Chip last week, we were talking about machines and, and convent or barbells. Yeah. And it's like, as long as the intention's there and – you know, you're doing it well, 
you can get super strong using machines. Oh, for sure. There's a reason they exist. Yeah. <laughs> because they work. They're effective. Yeah. It's just what else do you do besides that? Or, you know, there's the gym strength versus outdoor st- or life strength or applied strength. You know, like the other day with the with the physio ball wrestling. Okay, you've got this. You got adductor strength, but now how are you going to actually apply that in in a much more universal application, so to speak, right? And so, if I'm a, uh, a uh, if I'm a mat athlete or a grappler, man, I I got to make sure I can I have really strong adductors and I can and I know how to integrate that into the core tissues versus just sitting on a adductor machine and just bringing the knees together. I love that post. Yeah, it was a great video. It was exhausting. <laughs> it really, I like, I, I Neil came in the other day. Like after, Dennis was giving birth. <laughs> well, it was funny because after like did about 20, we spent about 20, 30 minutes doing it. And it just took me back to my wrestling days and how exhausted you would be and be like, shit, that is some hard work it's just fatiguing and then when we got together to do some filming two days after i was still tired i told me i'm like i'm I'm so sore i'm so sore like i'm just beat like i'm just tired so my body's like what the hell is that we haven't done that for freaking ever and now you're doing that but yeah and it was fun it was a lot of fun and then for sherry she was all like holy crap i got a lot of work to do because it was funny because when she went to do it, I was like, Pum. about 10 pounds of pressure. I'm like, Tunk. pulling the ball out. She's all like, and she was getting frustrated. I said, well, don't take, don't get frustrated. We're just going to keep practicing it. I said, it's just something that you, you sit at a computer all day. I move around all day. I do other things. Your job requires you to sit and stare at a computer. It, it is what it is. But we'll start to integrate this and we'll get better at it. It's just as simple as that. And I think what's so cool about that drill is you've got lower body compression and you've got upper body compression. Oh, yeah. And it's simple. And so I started doing uh, tug of war. So two people got to grab, got to take the same position with their legs. And then I, <laughs> I, set, I set one stick on each end. And so your objective is to get to the stick. while you, And you got to have the ball with you. Oh, it's hysterical. <laughs> I'll post that video later. It's, yeah, it's I got to see a visual of that. So are they are they basically in like a crab crawl? Pretty, yeah, you, you can do crab are... or, you can, or like okay. you can roll onto your stomach and you can try to flip the other person. But you got to be able to – you if you get to the stick and you don't have the ball, it doesn't count. Okay. You've got to have the ball, possession of the ball with your legs and get to the stick. But that's, that's, that's total body integration and really understanding how to incorporate all those lines of strength just at one time. It's like non, non-contact wrestling or something. Yeah, and, yeah. That's, and that's the thing because a lot of people don't like to wrestle, right? I mean, we do, we get mo- I think most people, like you tell them, okay, they're uncomfortable with it. And so it's kind of like trying to find a way to kind of not – be afraid of the contact, but still get that grappling, wrestling type of benefit out of it. So for me, it was kind of trying to find a way to say, how do I overcome that barrier of being uncomfortable? Even without the COVID, be, even before that, a lot of people are just uncomfortable with with that type of training, so to speak. Uh, like imagine you're a Mongolian warrior on horseback, squeezing, Sweet, you know. You're right. And, and like whole, drawing a heavy arrow or something like yeah type of strength you know because think about that that's right the mongols used to ride bareback on horses they didn't have saddles and so think of like anybody who's ridden a horse knows like when i grew up riding horses when i was younger and it, it's it's a lot of work but well, and then weren't they you know weren't they kind of leaning to the side yeah. sometimes to draw their bow so they had to they had to basically shift to the right. You know, they got all the weight hanging out to the right, and they got to squeeze that horse and try to come back up. It's kind of funny because there's times where I'm like, people always say, if I could build a time machine, I would go do this. And I kind of laugh because I'm like, if I could build a time machine, I would just want to go back and see what these people – like, I want to see that in person. Like, I want to see a Mongol warrior bareback on a horse. 
in mid battle pulling a bow. Like I just want to like, uh, holy shit! I mean, that's kind of the way I look at. It. If I could build a time machine, I'd go back. I'd want to see how things used to be and just just to observe and go, okay, yeah, you know, or see the way people back in Western Europe or Eastern Europe, you know, used to be four foot ten and and still carried around a, a claymore and still carried around, walked around with chain mail, you know, and, and full armor. Holy shit. How strong were you to be able to do that? I mean, that's for, and ride a horse. That's the kind of curiosity <laughs> that I, if I had a time machine, I'd love to go back and just watch that just for a little bit, just to see, see it in real action. Like see it in real time. What would right. you do with a time Simulation machine? Simulation running. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, that's, like historical battles, like, you know, Thermopylae or something, just to see, just to get a, hopefully I'm in a protective bubble, but to see a, uh, (laughs) how cool would that be? Yeah. And and I would like to, I'd like to abduct them like aliens and then pit them against each other and see who would win. (laughs) <laughs> like the Spartans. Who was, who was, remember that TV show about like the greatest warrior, what ultimate yes. warrior or something? Uh, wasn't that on, was that on History Channel? I think History Channel used to have that. They Is that were, where they were testing different yeah. weapons? No, no. They had different, fi- they would do ninja versus something else, right? Yeah, but they would take the weapons and they'd be like, and they'd like scale oh, them yes. or they give them some points that'd be interesting to see it really would yeah i remember that i was like okay this this blade you know would cut through faster than this blade because this blade weighs 40 pounds or that'd be interesting to see because it- and i think that would matter less than like what is the culture like what's the warrior code these people live by like i think just the weaponry is one thing and the technology but some of these like think of the Spartans or the samurai, like this is the way of life, you know? So my wife and I were, we were watching the last samurai last night and we we're saying the same thing. Like it's pretty cool. Just the, just the way they, there was so much intention in everything they did. Well, it's like the Nepali warriors, uh, the Gurkhas, you know, the Nepal is the only country that's never been successfully conquered, you know? And yes, it's a lot. It's the geography has to do with that. But it's also the mentality of the warriors, and, you know. And they've talked about with the Gurkha warriors, the mentality is that it's just at such a high level of never give up, never give up. But it'd be interesting, and that has so much to do with it. I mean, talking about mindset, I just watched the Barkley Marathon. Have you guys ever heard of this? No. Okay. There's a documentary out on, uh, I believe it's Amazon, called The Barkley Marathon. Now, this was filmed, I believe, in 2013 or 2014. So these two guys in Tennessee created a marathon. It's a 20-mile loop, and to complete it, you have to do this loop five times. (laughs) They're located by the prison that used to house um, James Earl Ray, who assassinated Martin Luther King. And he escaped. So it was considered the most escape-proof prison in U.S. history, and he escaped. And he, he was found, I think, after two days in the woods of Tennessee. So that kind of inspired this race, the two guys that created it. And so they had this, uh, this special forces guy, and he said, he goes, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. If you complete all five laps, which up until this documentary, in 25 years, only 10 people have done, you will, you will go, you will encounter 120,000 feet of elevation change in a hundred miles. And this is one day. No, this is, you give 60 hours, I believe, or 55 hours. I was going to, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's hysterical because only 40 people are allowed to run this every year. And so, and I looked it up afterwards and I think to this day, only 15 or 16 people have completed it total. And it's the Barkley. And so it goes into that mindset to hear this guy who had been in special forces say, and we know, I mean, special forces training is just to this whole different level. And this guy was all like, this is way more difficult 
to them than that. And I'm looking, and I'm watching this going, are you really? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But yeah, you should check out that, uh, it, it's called the Barkley Marathon. It's a, it's a fun little documentary. But uh, in the year they filmed that, three people actually completed it the year they filmed it. The way he sets it up, it's not just running. So you've got to find things along the way. So it's not because it's a, treasure. Says, a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it is a, a lot of the, tra- uh, it's not marked trails. So you're going off the marked trails. And so it's pretty interesting. It's, I can see why it would be such uh, a hard uh, ultra marathon, so to speak. So even if you're a good runner. Yeah, this matter. has nothing to do with running. This has nothing to do with running. This is, it's straight mental fortitude. That's all this is. I mean, and, and a lot of ultra marathon is the same thing, right? It, it's, there's that, but it, you, you technically, you typically, you see ultra marathoners with certain body types and this and that, but this is just to, when I, when I found it and I watched it, I was like, yeah, this is to a, just a totally different mentality. Because it's interesting because since you're off trail, uh, you should see the guy's legs. The people that do this, they're cut to shit. <laughs> I mean, it's just painful. And that's what the guy was saying. He goes, this is to a totally different level. I'm looking at the guy, They're doing a close-up on this one runner's legs. And it's just like just cut cuts all over the lower extremities. And I'm like, damn. And so, yeah. And then. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. So, yeah, I'll to check it out. I think you guys will like that. But it's the Barkley Marathon. But, yeah, it just gets into that mindset. And I think with going back and seeing the way these different groups of warriors trained, it was seeing that mindset. It's like what the Spartans used to pair, pair guys up because that became your brother pretty much. And so you were willing to fight to the death for that specific person. And so that was, as far as historians say, that was what Spartans used to do is you got matched up with somebody. And that was your mate. That was your partner. And that was who you died for and was willing to go to battle. For. Yeah, I don't think we could even talk about physical practice or training without – it's historically attached to warfare. Like mm-hmm. I was looking up the oldest – uh, recorded history of, of lifting, like people, a contest of strength. And I think it was 3600 BC in China, they were lifting rocks, like the military was doing it. And then I think after that, like they would come home to villages and then it would be more like a, a festival thing, like who's stronger, it would be a fun thing. And then I think they opened up weightlifting clubs as a sport and hobby, but you know, it's always tied to bigger, stronger, faster is going to help you conquer and defend yourself and, you know, battle. So yeah, that, that drive and innovation that came from that in the physical arts, I think that's where we go back and we have this fascination, at least as men as like, who, so who's the best warrior, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it's, true. It's very primal. Scott of oh, the Highland Games. Who was the first person that said, I'm going to take this log and I'm going to grab it and hold it on end and I'm going to see if I can flip it over? Really? You're, they're just drinking, yeah? <laughs> that's how, that's yeah. Not happened. how drunk you know? were you? Like, I'm like, really? How drunk did like, you have to out. be? Check out how far you toss this thing. You're like, oh shit, I want to try that. Right? If somebody actually did, yeah. and then and then looked at their buddy and said, "I bet you can't do that." And he's like, "Screw that! I got this." Right? I think that's hysterical. Well, you guys might know this. Who was the guy? Was it in? It might have been late 1800s, early 1900s. They were at this like tavern bar, getting drunk, drinking, and someone was like pointed to the top of some mountain. It was like, I bet you can't climb up there. And like, I bet I can. And they just went up and like nailed some, put some nails. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was that? Was that from Valley Uprising? Yeah, I think so. I forget what that, I forget yeah, the guy's name. Yeah. But yeah, it's always a bet, man. It's always a challenge. <laughs> it's always a challenge. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's how it starts, right? That's how it starts. Uh, I, competitive walking used to be a big thing to get off the of strength a little bit, but competitive, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know competitive walking was like Olympic walking. Or? No, if you actually look, you will see, you can actually Google 
old articles and they would print like these were a big deal. Competitive distance walking was a big deal in the United States. Huh. And you can look up old New York Times articles. And, and so it was a big thing. So and so walked a hundred miles from point from this town to this town in this time. And it was like oh. a big deal. It was the weird I was like, huh? And so when I was looking into it, I was like, holy shit, like this was a thing. It was and these people were like celebrities. Like they were well known people. And I was like, oh, who knew who knew? First I thought you were talking about have you seen the speed walking or power? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking too, like the Olympic speed walking. No, this was no, this isn't that. This I guess it was just purely walking. Like I don't they never talked the, I don't think it was like a special form. It was just walking. Have you seen how fast those guys go? Oh, I They're doing like six or seven minute miles. Yeah, I, that's ridiculous. Or something. It's amazing watching how they do it. They can't lift up like two feet at the same time. Right? Yes, no, one foot has to be in contact. So it's very like, like swimmy, shouldery. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's fascinating, yeah. I think we've all tried to uh, try to try it once. Two or two times in a bet, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that's got to burn a lot more calories because jogging and running is more efficient, right? Yeah. It's got to be, you got to be, I would like to do it and see where I'm sore the next day. Do it for like a half hour. Give, it, give yourself like a half hour, shit, even 20 minutes. It's the, origi- it's the original cheat torque right there in motion. Yeah. It, it is, right? It totally well, is. Going back to the, the, wa- the old time, I guess, walking sport. That's pretty much the most human sport that you could create. Like we're gonna we're gonna it walk is. travel distance. <laughs> yeah, it's the original form of travel, right? I've been running. I've been really enjoying uh, uh, adding hill sprints to my during my hikes. So I've been adding that in a lot. There's uh, the one of the trails by my house here. Uh, there's like two hills that are just perfect. Really good for doing hill sprints. So it's just a little bit of a hike, and then I'll stop. I'll get to these hills, and then I'll do like five or six sprints up the hills. It just feels it feels great. It, it really does. It feels so good. It's kind of funny because people on the trail kind of look at me like I'm goofy because they're like, "Why would you do that?" And it's funny because it, and it shows you the mind, the limited mindset that we have for movement in today's society that people just think that that's weird running up a hill and, and, or doing sprints up these hills. And it's like, why would you think that's odd? You go to a gym, which is a space designated for an environment set up for lifting and, uh, you know, all the w- the handles on the weights. But imagine you just walked across someone putting something up and picking it up and putting it down, picking it up and putting it down or laying down and like, <laughs> without context, it is weird. Like, yeah, and you ask someone walking by, hey, can you spot me real quick? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. In the context of it, it looks weird. It, just sitting back and, and getting an idea of, of people's perceptions. See, now, if you got these old school warriors, see, if you gave them a time machine and you oh. showed them what we were doing now, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see what their perspective is. I, would love, I would love to see that because, I mean, imagine if – like, what if we can go back and so we did the ultimate warrior test, okay. and maybe one group one, and then we restart it and we go back a few years and we're like, here's a barbell or a kettlebell, you know, yeah. <laughs> or I don't know, here's here's a translated training book by Mark Ripito. I don't know. You put you put something to the test. Would that actually make a difference? Would it increase performance on battlefield, decrease? I would love to see that, you know? Yeah, and the other thing, like, if you think about martial arts today, you know, all it is is it's it's combat training broken up into all these different pieces. So now, if you were to go back in the day and someone saw a Taekwondo studio, you're like, well, why are they just kicking? You know, why aren't they, why aren't they incorporating everything? You know, does that just kicking does that really work in real life combat yeah i have a feeling um hand-to-hand combat our modern ufc champ would probably destroy everyone else in history no i think if you could take 
if you could take one like in a weight in a weight class, you take a warrior yeah. and put them in the mixed martial arts. I have a feeling they would they would be beat because I think they'd be bound by their own culture. Today we're so interconnected with everything, like you were saying. You know, that'd be fascinating. It would be great. Somebody's got to build a time machine. Somebody's got to be working on that shit. Where's Elon Musk when you need him? <laughs> That's his next thing. <laughs> He's like first space and then time travel. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we discover another planet with like some alien species that's going through, you know, they have tribes. There'd be scientists studying it, but what we need to do is make a big reality TV show out of it for our entertainment and just <laughs> pit them against each other. <laughs> That would get huge ratings, actually. Well, thanks for joining us, brother. I appreciate it, man. It was a great conversation yeah, with you, man. That was good times. It was great talking about uh, some different aspects of what is strength and, and, and how we obtain it. And, and hopefully for the listeners out there, you, you've got uh, a little bit of a different perspective and some ideas and things that uh, maybe have piqued your curiosity levels. Uh, be sure to definitely check out DJ on his account and look into the programming for that he's offering. Uh, he's going to be extremely beneficial for you. And, and really, like everything we've gone after in here, it's just giving you something, some food for thought and going with an open mind and say, let me try something different. And, and who, hell, who knows? Maybe that one skill level, maybe you dig into something that, that you're really good at and yet you just haven't done it. And all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, like I really excel at this. And so, you know, you got that dormant talent, that dormant skill that just hasn't been discovered yet, but you can only do that by trying out different methodologies and, and different techniques and, and understanding different principles. Right. Yep. Any last thoughts, brother, before we leave? I just hope uh, people, people are now confused and lost after hearing this chat <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, I think you, you summed it up. Well, hopefully it's, you know, just food for thought, maybe something uh, new to spark some curiosity. And uh, is, is your Instagram, you know, the, your biggest uh, social following, is that where, you know, people should go see you or YouTube or what are the, what are the channels that you're on there? Uh, yeah, just head to, uh, Instagram at strong camps, uh, link to my website there, uh, online movement university.com. Right on, man. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Man. Thank you everyone for listening. We appreciate it as always. Uh, if you appreciate the podcast, follow, uh, hit that subscription button. We'd really appreciate it. And, uh, DJ brother, always as pleasure as always. And, uh, this will be the first of many times we have you on, right? I hope so. Yeah, I love awesome. chatting with you guys always. Sounds good. All right, everybody out there, be good to each other. Peace.